Well, welcome back, everyone, to the next episode of The Gentlewoman Boss. I'm your host, Michelle Horlbogen, and I'm very excited to have um, a true gentlewoman of a guest here today. Uh, her name, you may know her from her online writing hall of fame. Uh, her name is Heidi Lynn Carter, and Heidi is a senior contributor for Forbes and a contributor for the Philadelphia Business Journal. She's a leadership coach and workplace culture consultant, helping repair toxic cultures and develop managers into impactful leaders. Heidi is a domestic violence mentor, a volunteer leadership coach for Babson College students, and an active activist and advocate against workplace bullying. So now you know why I wanted her on the show. So <laughs> without further ado, welcome, Heidi. I'm so happy to have you here. I am so excited when I saw you launch this podcast, and I was like, I would love to be on this with her. <laughs> oh, it's so it's so exciting. Um, I was thinking today, trying to remember how we connected. I think I read an article of yours and commented, or some. It was very random, and then you actually replied, and, and then we. It's just the beauty of LinkedIn and like yeah. we've just been your yeah, your your writing on these topics, your work is amazing and it's so um so much insight. So I'm really excited to have you here to share your um professional experience, your knowledge, your insights on the topics. Um we know you know my story, I know yours somewhat. So um we, we feel passionately about educating people and raising awareness. Oh, yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about Heidi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow. So, you know, what really led me down this path? So actually, I started my career in human resources. And the funny part about this is I fell in love with human resources in the fourth grade. So it all happened when you have your take your child to work day. And I went to school with, or I went to work with my grandmother and she worked at Mack Trucks in the finance department. And like a typical grandma, she's going to wave you around like, this is my little princess. This right, is my granddaughter, right. right? So anyway, we're going around and she's, you know, I get introduced to the human resources department. I didn't really understand exactly what they did, just mm -hmm. that they were the fun department. They brought everyone together and they really, they created that community, right? And for me, I was like, that's me. That resonated with me. Still didn't fully understand what it was, but I, I geared my whole life going into HR because I wanted to change around workplaces and I, I wanted to create that, that bond within the workplace and make it better for everyone involved, but more so employee focused. Well, blah, 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 fast forward, you know, I, I go into my internship and I start experiencing bullying, right? But I was like, okay, this is an internship. I was getting made fun of by senior people there. And then, um, you know, it didn't really hit me until um, <laughs> until a job that it was so intense. I was in HR and the highest level of HR was bullying me and our entire department while tearing down the entire company. And it's a smaller company. So she wasn't even being silent about making fun of other people. And that whole experience, it was terrible. It, it. I, I, it was just absolutely terrible, Michelle. And like you, like anyone else that's being bullied, you go through these stages of like, oh no, you downplay it. Like, oh, it's just a, it's just a couple comments, nothing crazy, you know. Oh, if I keep my head down and working, like it'll go away. And then these comments start to hit, and you're like confused, like why, why, what's wrong with me? What's going on? And then your confidence starts to deteriorate because you start to second guess yourself and you try to make up for it in other ways by working harder and your anxiety heightens, you start losing sleep, your, your relationships change, your relationship with eating changes, you know, everything starts going crazy until it just all comes to a head. And for me, it was when I decided, um, I decided I was going to confront my manager because at that point she had uh, just taken it too far. And the moment that I confronted her, she didn't even blink an eye. She was just like, you have less than 24 hours to either quit or get fired. And oh my I, didn't, I didn't have any backup plan. I'm in a whole different country, depending on the visa. I had no backup plan. And I had like, I was just like, 
deep inside, I knew that this wasn't okay, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But I was just like, I, I need the job. I need the money. I What am I going to do? Like, it took me how long to get to this point? I, I, what can I do? I just, I, I don't know. And from there, I, at that moment, I remember I went home because I only had less than 24 hours to make up my decision. And immediately, because I was already writing for Forbes at this point, I was like, you know what? No one, I don't want anyone else to feel like I feel right now because I have no idea what my future holds. You know, I have no idea. I just feel like the rug was ripped out from under me and I was trying to do everything in my power to not get on her bad side, to not, you know, I was taking the comments, taking everything from her and I'm still losing my job. How is this happening? So I, I just remember that was when my first Forbes article went up about workplace bullying. I was like, I, and I realized then that I was going to use my platform to bring more awareness to this because this is not okay. And when I was in my internship and I overlooked it, that wasn't okay. But so many people do that. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Yeah. And I, I can't, I had a, my, the rug pulled out from under me too. Um, you know, losing my job, literally, I got a phone call. I didn't even get to go back to my office, but, um, uh, for also some, you know, standing up for what's right. Um, but my point is I was at least in my, like, you know, the next state over and I could, I was in my own home. Like I wasn't in a foreign country on a visa being threatened to lose my job. That's like, it's almost like you want, maybe want to go back and beg at that point. Like uh, you must've been terrified. You are a brave, brave woman. I mean, not just because of this, I've read a lot of your other things. You are a brave woman. Yeah, I was I was terrified to be honest with you because even though I was going through it, I didn't plan to leave. Mm -hmm. And that's the sad part. It's like would have stayed. You well, you didn't expect and I think that's a classic that's a classic bully style. You, you're such a good-hearted person and w working for the good of all in the company, right? And a bully will take advantage of that and do exactly that. Just rip, be so nasty. It's, it's just there. I've done so much research, too, in reading and educating myself about um, the narcissistic, you know, passive-aggressive, all these traits, the dark triage, I think they call one of them, like all these traits that come together in these people that they get a little bit of power, and it becomes this huge, like control freak thing. And it's just, and it's the same in any level of um, yeah. abuse, domestic abuse, work abuse, um, all these different levels, same tactics. They employ the same tactics. So once you're aware yeah. of it in one level, but again, a lot of times, even in those situations, people are terrified to act, right? And so the, it continues. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it, it it's just makes me so angry for you. Like here you are, this young woman in a foreign country, and yeah. who does that to someone? Like even if even if it was like you have two weeks, like give someone time to prepare. No, they go all nasty bully, which is exactly. Yeah. But now you're going all <laughs> writing in all these major worldwide yeah. publications exposing the issue on a public platform, and yeah. I know you have hundreds of thousands of views of your articles right can you what are the stats i mean you must do they give you stats like does forbes or you can check them on the back end i can check them and it really ranges so yeah. we just went into a new platform a contributor platform a few mm -hmm. months ago and what's neat about well i guess it goes month to month right okay. and it it breaks it down by article so sometimes like in the beginning i was really addicted to seeing my stats and then i was like you know what heidi just stop <laughs> You, you, you learn that early. Don't focus on the numbers. Focus on putting out genuine content that can help people. That yeah. resonates through all of your articles, not even on this topic. I mean, I read a lot of your works and um, you're writing from the heart. People see that, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I didn't want to put out fluff. And I wanted to really, like, I, I promised myself when I got with Forbes that I was okay with losing Forbes, with losing that platform, if I was being authentic to myself mm -hmm. and to other people. And I promised myself because I was looking around at other articles and they barely touched the topic. And I'm like, mm -hmm. no, 
people need to know tips. They need to know exactly right. what workplace bullying looks like. They need to know stats, what they can do, their resources. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I didn't find that. And I'm like, no, I needed this. Other people need this because what's the first thing you do? I remember when I was in abusive relationships, the first thing I did is I went to Google because I was like, I need confirmation that I'm not the only person in the world doing it. I'm not it. crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> right, right. So I went right to Google. And that's that's what people do is they just, they're too scared to talk to their friends or their close ones about it. So they, right. they go to Google about it, right? Or they start researching. And I want to be what they find to help them. Right on the other end of typing in that search word, yeah. right. In the past, I mean, it's seven, eight, seven to eight months, I've been reading up on it, writing a little bit on it too. But there's now, there is a wealth of information now that was not there before. And I think, I guess it happens in every industry, but I feel like there's sort of these, I forget what they call them, like silent trolls that are like reading and watching content that goes out. And when these they see... The, a good public response. They'll take that same topic, maybe some of your your own words, and reshare it under their platform, which you know is it's part of you know writing, being a, a writer. But um, it's almost like someone had to go out there and brave that storm first. Yeah. So you're one of those people, Heidi. Yeah. You are. You know what's interesting is I actually have alerts set up so anytime statistics, blogs, any sort of information breaks about toxic workplaces, bullying, uh, mm -hmm. domestic violence, I it goes right to my inbox and I'm right on top of it. And I cannot tell you how many times people have tried to replicate my articles and I just look at them and just like, okay, <laughs> whatever. I know. <laughs> but to me, it's like, what is that, that quote? Um, there's no greater compliment than being copied, there's True. no there's no greater compliment than someone copying you or some, yeah. something to that effect. So that's just how you have to look at it. And you know what? If there if there's well, not seriously, like if it's absolute plagiarism, you've got to look into it. But yeah. if they're spreading the word about it, you know. And I know another common denominator we have, which has as well, is women bullying women in the workplace. Right? This is the offshoot of Me Too, yeah. that literally was barely addressed until this past year. And it's sort of that silent epidemic because women, like you said, you went into HR because you wanted to help everybody. You wanted the entire work experience for the employees to be as good as it could be, right? Male or female, it doesn't matter. You're, you're, you're a team player. You want good for everyone. Yep. But for some reason, when women climb the ladder and get into a position of power, especially over other women, they, it's like, they don't know how to handle it, which to me just says something huge lacking in them as a person anyway, because, you know, are you kicking someone with your heels away from the, you yeah. know, below you, or are you yeah. putting your hand down? We've all seen that image, pulling them up. And I think that's why I actually decided to call my, my, um, podcast, the gentle woman boss podcast, because it's not that guys can't um, glean from it, learn from it, you know, appreciate what I'm trying to do here. Yeah. But my experience was women to women yeah. and, you know, being in, it sounds like was your, yours was too, correct? Correct. Yeah. 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 And there's a, there's just, and being the troopers we are, we don't want to draw negative attention to negative flack from another woman in the office because we're supposed to be all team players and you know working together for equality mm -hmm. yeah. but there's people that they they just use that in this twisted way to their own advantage and it's just yeah. so that's yeah that's my that's going in my book for sure <laughs> yeah. yeah and uh something interesting is so I do I target mainly women for this this aspect and if you look back through my Forbes column and all the pictures it's the focus is always on women because I just feel like my experience of what I went through is I don't, I don't want any other woman who is under a toxic woman to carry on those traits that they're uh, seeing, right? That they're looking up right. to in someone else. So if I can target them and speak directly to them, you know, I still attract men too. I'm not trying to, you know, but no, right. Yeah. 
So, and uh, a couple people have noticed that, and they're like, how comes all of your pictures are always women? And I was like, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> I actually did not notice it, but now that I'm thinking of your articles, yeah. Um, and another thing, I don't know if you've had men reach out to you. Um, I've had a lot of direct messages, because, you know, I, I kind of put out there to people, tell, have you been through something like this? Tell me your story. We can keep it anonymous, or if you want to share it. And in everything started coming, the inbox, the emails. But I've had a lot of men reach out and say, because they didn't want to detract from the Me Too movement, uh, you know, as far as they're almost afraid to say anything if they're being harassed by a woman or bullied by a female executive because they don't want to, like, seem like they're trying to take the light off of the sexual harassment, you know, male to female. But there is absolutely a need for that to be addressed, too, because they they're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, you know? And um, I, I did tell them, you know, yes, in time, you know, I will address it. Maybe look up some, maybe that can be a project for Heidi, look up some yeah. statistics and all that kind of stuff, because um, at least we can talk about it. I feel like some of these guys that are victims, they don't really, and, and you know, there's that guy thing, like you don't want to admit it to your best buddy on the, you know, basketball court that this woman at work is, making your life miserable, right? It seems almost like it's emasculating. It's not. But I think as a man, there's just yeah. that culture of, I got my game, you know? And a lot of times yeah. it's, it's not like that. And that, and you're spot on with that too, right? Um, and that's something that I do want to address, but it's so hidden. And um, I'm trying to figure out the angle that I want to touch upon it because mm -hmm. it's such, a, like men feel that like if they're not taken seriously for one because you're a man you're supposed to be mighty and male and macho right. and you don't deal with this you know um and so they have to suffer in silence from it right right and so I I want to write an article where I can empower them but not you know it's just a, a, a sensitive topic that I do want to address but I'm still digesting how I want to move forward with it and right. still finding Finding the information and being able to find men that, you know, might want to be quoted about it. That's difficult, too. You know, it is. Like you said, there's yeah. that societal societal stigma, I guess, that they yeah. need to keep this stiff upper lip and be in control all the time. And, yeah, we love our guys to be like that it makes us feel better and safer. <laughs> but at the same time, we're all human. Yeah. And, you know, we know what it's like to be targeted and harassed. So. Yeah. Um, it's not right on any level, no matter what the combination of people involved, it's not right, you know, no. um, because, and I, one of the reasons I actually, when I email people about my podcast, I say, you know, please no swearing <laughs> because yeah. I don't want, I don't want to have to mark it explicit yeah. because I want teenagers in high school. Like if they find this, I mean, granted, we're talking more workplace, but I want the information and what my guests share yeah. to help even kids in school because we know that's that's what people think of bullying the first thing you think of is kids in school of course yeah. we know now it has no beginning or end time right I mean, bullying happens in families yeah it can happen within you know whenever there's i just lost my dad and there's all this turmoil you know sometimes when things happen in the family and the, and those those bullies come out, up out of the ashes, you know, and they just try to control everything and take over. So it's something we have to learn to cope with, but also not be afraid. We have to find the courage to speak up against it and say to people, not acceptable. I mean, I was I was always very timid and quiet as a child, believe it or not. Um, I, I was a peacemaker. Yeah. But but sometimes it got to the point like when that line was drawn, I didn't care. I mean, I yeah. whacked football players. I I, you know, the neighborhood, the kids, like when they got yeah. really, I just, there's just this switch that would happen. It's like, I'm not taking this anymore. Yeah. Or I'm not going to let you do that to them anymore. Yeah. You know, and, and it's harder I think when you're young, you can clobber, you know, backhand someone while you play yeah. volleyball and you, you might hear your mother yell out the window, but we can't do that in a workplace. So, <laughs> no. you know, it's, it's a different, we have to learn to fight differently, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what I love about this time period right now is we are more empowered to speak up. And with movements such as Time's Up and Me Too yeah. 
and with celebrity women, you know, speaking up and employees calling out their employers. We have a long way to go, but I am so glad that we are finally using our voices to gain that momentum and get that ball rolling. And absolutely, yeah, even with you being able to do this podcast, being able to speak out on LinkedIn, right? If this would have happened, I don't know how many years ago, you would have been shunned. I, I know from I employers, know. right? Like, <laughs> well, I think that has happened, but it's okay <laughs> because I have the big picture mind. I'm in for yeah. the long haul, so I'm gonna I'm gonna struggle through. Yeah. But it's true. Like, and also you mentioned the celebrities. We have uh, Deborah Dugan with the uh, the Recording Academy. Did I lose you? No, no. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Um, she was the CEO for the Grammys. The and was put on administrative leave about three weeks after she sent a lengthy email to HR listing all of these issues, ethical issues she felt the comp- you know, the recording academy had to address. They yeah. put her on administrative leave. They fi- ended up firing her. She's got this big wig law firm in New York City that I wish I could afford. <laughs> she, they, she filed that week. She filed with the EEOC. And it's like this huge, I mean, there was like attempts for payout and this and that. And it's it's bad publicity, bad. And the point is, I think in, it, with, to what you said about having these platforms now to speak up, there's an accountability now. You know, you can't just... feel like someone's threatening to expose something and fire them and brush them under the carpet. That's not going to fly anymore. No way. I mean, she was the CEO. It's like, it's like, (laughs) okay, who did you think you were dealing with? You know, you think she was just going to go away quietly. So I am like, so, so proud of her for taking her stand. Um, But having, like I said, celebrities speak up like that, that because they have hundreds of thousands, millions of followers, and it just raises awareness to something like you said that a few years ago it was like, uh-uh, yeah. not having that conversation. I'm glad. And one of the things that I'm also excited about is SHRM, the Society of Human Resource Management. Now they're finally acknowledging this, right? Mm-hmm. And they have created this nationwide initiative. And I think that is also helpful like you're you're getting celebrities and you know these lawsuits and employers speaking out and journalists and um, now you're getting the Society of Human Resource Management on board and I think I'm not talking negatively it's it's time right finally it's it's long overdue yeah because and they if if they had led from the from the you know in the beginning setting these standards of what's acceptable what is not accountability it would have, it would have, could have saved a lot of people a lot of heartache. But you know, thank goodness, like you said, at least they're getting on board and they're putting these things in place. Um, hopefully, that will protect employees. Yeah, I think it's definitely still a work in progress. And you know, it's so interesting because we still have the older generation in the workforce, right? Mm-hmm. And specifically, uh, I guess the boomers. Um, I can only speak, there was a family member that I, I'm really close with her, but I would always confide in her about what I was going through, even during that time when I was being bullied severely by my own HR manager. And it was just quickly like, "Eh, this is what, I dealt with this my entire career. You just have to get used to this. This is, this is what the working world is about. And I would get so angry with her. I was like, Mm -hmm. no, it's not. Why do I have to put up with this? No, I know. (laughs) But it's, you know, and it's true. Like, I don't know if you watched Mad Men at all. No, I don't. series. So I love vintage clothes and all that. So I was, I, I enjoyed watching. I didn't watch every episode, but I, I caught it when I could. But it definitely gives you a glimpse of what, you know, corporate America was like for women in the late 50s, early 1960s. You were just lucky they let you have a desk and a typewriter. I mean, it was like that was the, the, yeah. um, condescending attitude you know it's like you're just lucky you're here and in the way I mean granted it was Hollywood but from people I've talked to probably like you said your relative it's it is the way it was it was horrible sexual harassment everyone was you know six martini lunches and coming back and harassing the women and just all the crazy but that's that's not it wasn't acceptable then it's it's not acceptable now but like you said they didn't have the resources or 
if they said something, they'd lose their job, yeah. you know, and that was such a turning point for women in the workforce that you'd be considered a traitor if you complained, I'm sure. Like, yep. suck it up, buttercup, right? This is yeah. so yeah. But we, it's not like that anymore. It's not like I approached my superiors and addressed a few ethical concerns I had. And two days later, over the phone, I was fired. So I had no chance to meet with anyone, um, no chance to investigate the things I potentially saw as an issue that I felt was my responsibility to bring to someone's attention, which could have been completely wrong. But it could have been absolutely nothing. Well, why would they fire me? But anyway, so that I had relatives, friends, you know, for one thing, when it's not happening to you, it's hard to really empathize. And I get that. Okay. So I had one relative that I, a very successful businessman, and he said, you know, some, and very ethical too, very right is right, wrong is wrong, black and white. Yeah. Sometimes you have to just look the other way. And I was like, I mean, coming from this person, it was like, are you kidding me? You just like deflated everything I thought you stood for in business. Not, you know, not entirely yeah. a human being, but it was like, but I understood what he was saying because you, you take that risk when you do yeah. speak up, right? You, um, did I expect that reaction that quickly? No, yeah. no, which, yeah. you know, opens all these questions of what, what, what did I do? But, um, what's going to be discovered? What's going to be investigated? We don't know, but, um, it, I think, it, you know, I, I had the thing like, oh, anyway, tons of people get fired every day, things like that, which is just yeah. trying to make you feel better. But when yeah. it's because like you, you like when you, you know, you just did something for the good of the organization or to try to protect it or to even protect your superiors who would be on a, yeah. held accountable. If this is an issue, it's going to be on them. It's on their watch. You're trying to protect them and they I hear you. You know, it's like that. That was the, ugh, you know, because yeah. I should have, I should have just minded my own business, but I couldn't because that's not who I am as a person. So mm -hmm. it is what it is. And even when you try to go to people and confide to them in the organization, I was met with a lot. Oh, that's just how she is. I'm just thinking, what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, um, I had the chairman of the board. I had to tell him a, an experience that had happened with her that I felt he needed to know. And he said, she's just passionate. Oh, gosh. So there's all these words people use because they yeah. don't want to deal with it. You know, yep. and it's like, okay, I, I, I'll try to alert someone and just see how that ball keeps rolling downhill. So yeah. it, it, it is. And, it, and there's a lot of that, too. People... Um, I don't know. Sometimes I think people that are, their presence is large too. Do you know what I'm talking yep. about? Like some people have, I mean, I'm yeah. five foot one, yeah. 130 pounds. I know I'm overweight. I mean, I wear heels just so I can feel like I can look people in the eye. So I'm not, I'm not a presence person. Like I'm, I mean, I'm there, but I'm not, but you know, there's some people that like, they don't respect personal space and they, mm -hmm. Their their personal space is like three times your personal space. Yeah, that, <laughs> that strong personality too yeah. that yeah. they know they can use to to kind of make people fearful. So it's it's like an intimidation and bullying that's of the silent kind. It's just yeah. that presence, and and I have seen men, grown men, successful professional men, like cower at people like yes. that, and it's like. Uh, be a man, you know. I want to yeah. like, be a man, like <laughs> say something, speak up. But I think people just don't want to take it on. They don't, they don't want to take it on, and and then it's like the elephants in the room, and no one's acknowledging it, and and then they kind of they do they run their own rodeo for until I don't know until karma catches up. I don't know. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's, it's it's there's so many kinds of there's so many ways, and it's also a skill. I think bullies learn, yeah. right? To I listened to a TEDx talk by Matt Packness. Do you know Matt? He wrote um, "Real Leaders Don't Bully." I think is the title of his book. I, I'm pretty sure he's. I'll send you his information. Yeah. He's great, but he he gives a, an incredible um, 
uh, TEDx talk about resilience, bouncing back from adversity, you know, how, how do you climb back up when you've been knocked down so many times? It's, it was, I was like crying. It was beautiful. But he talks about how physical size is a huge bearing a lot of times with bullies, especially with men, you know, like sports teams in the locker room, that, that threatening type of thing and how his own father was actually a very big man and was a bully. And Matt is also a big man, but he's like a gentle giant. You know, he, yeah. has, he has his father's build and, and presence, but his mother's soft and gentle nature. So he kind of got the best of both in a way. But, he, you know, he does get into that, how people use their physical presence to try to intim intimidate you. And out of self-protection, we, we, we let them because we don't, you know, we're all, we're all in that in self-protection mode so yeah I agree. I agree so you talked you mentioned something about a book that you're working on in addition yes. to all of your thousands of articles so you want to tell <laughs> us about that yeah so my book is really more of a memoir it's about my journey a lot of people have been just asking about it and a brief background so I'm a domestic violence survivor um I was born into into domestic violence. It's all that I've known. Um, and then, you know, I just had to deal with that all my life and learn how to break the cycle, learn how to love myself. Um, you know, I've had a lot of traumatic situations happen throughout my life. So, you know, finding my mom with a suicide note, workplace bullying, oh. domestic violence, just a lot of things that just should have crippled me. Mm -hmm. And what I did instead is, is I, I use it as my platform to help others. And that's exactly what I'm doing. And I, I found my purpose along the way through running and traveling and living around the world, right? And so I'm writing a book on it in hopes that my journey inspires other people to not oh only break the cycle of domestic violence, but to stand up against workplace bullying, to walk away from you know any sort of toxic relationship, to heal again, to find your way and find your purpose to move forward. That is um. incredible. That's <laughs> incredible. No, you said something very profound though. Like one of those things, right, could cripple a, a person. Yeah. One of those things. I mean, I mean, how does one person, how do you stay above the mire, but the other next person ends up medicated? I mean, like, like, like barely functioning person yeah. in society because it crushes them. And I think it's, it's, I think you also made a key point that you, to you, you made it your goal to help others. So when you, t I mean, of course, yeah. you can't help but focus on yourself. You're heartbroken but if yeah. you can look outward and then you're at least relieving some of that demand on of your within and you're yeah. pushing out and it can help you it, it's a huge factor i think in coping and bouncing back mm -hmm. in like building that resilience is reaching yeah. out because it's while well, the bible says there's more happiness in giving than in receiving so if you yeah. can find find that strength to do that and it's so hard when you're in that the depth of despair mm -hmm. to even think beyond your own situation but yeah. if you can it, it's a game changer i mean you're proof of that yeah and it took it took a lot of work to get to this point right mm -hmm. and that's the thing is you know a lot of people look at me and they instantly judge me because they catch my energy and i'm optimistic and i'm positive and they I get a lot of comments of like, oh, life must have been easy for you. You must have had everything <laughs> handed to you. And I'm thinking, sweetheart, <laughs> quite the opposite. Okay, let me tell you. Yeah. I only recently scraped myself off a rock bottom. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. If you only knew yeah. the whole story. Yeah. The thing is, I want to show people that, you know what? Don't judge me by my happiness and my positivity because you don't know my story. You don't know anyone's story. And yeah. once I healed myself, and I'm not I'm not 100% healed, but once I really heal myself to a point that I can look at other people and really be like, wow, you know what? I they must be going through something and I'm not going to judge where they're at in their life right now. You know what I mean? It's yeah. a while to get there because I'm not going to lie. I I really 
I was so envious and jealous of people who had a family that loved them, who had a good relationship with a man or a woman that never laid a hand on them or, you know what I mean? Yes, I do. Yeah. Jealous of that, that because I hated myself on the inside, I was like, wow, you must have had it so easy. Like you never had a struggle, but that's not the reality. Right. You don't know. And I think, it is hard to, it, I mean, that's another, that's a, a huge um, self-growth mark when you can be happy for other people having something you long for or you miss out on that you want. That's a, that's a huge coming around, you know, process to heal ourselves. And, and like you said, we don't know their whole story like the ins and outs on either side, right? So there could be, there could be yuck there too. And, and we live in the, we live in the age of filters and, you know, Instagram success stories. So I don't know. I mean, we, it always looks like, you know, you're getting the highlight reel, right? We're getting the highlight reel a lot of times. Now the past couple of weeks, maybe a little more reality is coming through on social media because yeah. this COVID-19 has been like the great equalizer because it is not, there is no bias or prejudice. It attacks whoever, wherever, whenever. It doesn't matter how much money you have or fame or education, if you've been a good person or a horrible person, right? It's, it's scary. And I think, I think in a way it's kind of nice to see those filters come down and people understand it's not all about me, right? And, it's about having compassion and empathy and humanity and trying to help your neighbor. Oh you know? yeah. Hands down. This, you know, this has really brought us together and you're right. What I love even more from the business perspective is companies, you know, are, they're taking their focus off of profits mm -hmm. to help others, non-essential companies that have had to close their doors they were going to lose anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Now they're focusing on making essential products and like breweries, distilleries. There's I hand did sanitizer. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just like, I'm, I did some research on an article. Um, and I was like, wow, like America, the world, we're coming together and we're putting the profits aside. Mm -hmm. And now even with the workforce and remote work and people are like, okay, how can I better manage my team? Well, I mean, yeah, I'm glad you're finally looking into this, right? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, exactly. you're right. All the walls are dropping and we're coming together and acting like humans again. To try to see the silver lining, which we're hearing about a lot, you know, you, you can have more time with your family. You have more time for hobbies. You have more time to self-care you're, you're not stuck in traffic on your commute every day anymore you're not scrambling to cook a halfway decent dinner for your kids before they go off to soccer all those stresses which are great in their own way because it's just life yeah this it's paused now so try to take advantage of the pause and reconnect like you said as human beings yeah. you know it is it is it is a gift in a way inside of the mess um yeah try to take advantage of, you know, I guess, but I think the, to your point about team management too, um, are you seeing leaders that were like maybe micromanagers or, or, um, had difficulty delegating, like they are struggling now more than others that had that trust with their staff? Oh yeah. Hands down because remote work requires a, a specific or not a specific, a special skill set right? Mm -hmm. If you already have difficulty managing a person, <laughs> that is going to, remote work is going to bring out a lot of your flaws because you just can't. And the problem that a lot of managers are facing is because they can't physically see their employees, they automatically assume they're not doing anything. And that's where the lack of trust comes in. Right. And then the bombarding of emails, constant calling. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Which is a leadership flaw to begin with, because yeah. the number one thing on a team is there has to be mutual respect and trust, right? Yeah. There, there has to be. I mean, I worked for a very non-trusting boss, um, micromanager, uh, you know, taking credit for everything, all the, you know, 
it's like no matter and wh- when you're th- when you're working for someone like that what are your options yeah are you going to trust when you're not when you're feeling like you're not being trusted you know it's just i don't know and, and they wonder why so many employees just do the bare minimum to get by cuz that's what their boss is expecting of them they yeah. think I'm a slacker, so I'll be a slacker. You know, it's yeah. almost like it, it feeds that negative cycle. Yeah. And yeah. why should you go above and beyond for someone that doesn't even make you feel good about your work, appreciate you, respect you? Yeah. I, I know. I I know. <laughs> or like you said, you, you fall into the other category that you try harder and harder and take on more and more and more. I mean, I, I one um, company I worked for, I it was like a learning curve. I, I t- t- took on a development office and the database and there was nothing to work from. I had to do everything from scratch and all that and setting up online giving and um, trying to have some fundraising organization and everything. And then they decided to put an internal um, television station in the organization. And it was going to be my job to create all the content for it. Okay. I was told this like after, okay. you know, the company came to, to talk to the, the key staff. So I'm like, why, why didn't, why wasn't I invited to the meeting? Like, if this is going to be my responsibility to create content for a television channel, I know nothing about that. Right. Why you, I should have been able to ask the questions I needed to ask, you know? And it was like, no, always, that's what I mean. Like kept on the outer parameter, but just dumped all the new work. And I, I got so sick. I ended up with Epstein Barr virus and I was out of work for three weeks. I had a fever for three weeks. I slept more than I was awake for three weeks. Um, they did hold my job, maybe partially feeling guilty. I don't know. But it, I ended up having to resign a few months later. I was so, I, I, if you, and if you know anything about it, but you, you, it's like mono times 500. Ooh. Like it's, it's like there are Olympic athletes that have lost their careers because they contracted it and they, it just knocks you. Like you figure if it takes an Olympic athlete completely out of yeah day to day living, what's it going to do to a five yeah. foot one housewife? I mean, I was just obliterated and um, I, and I, I, while I was laying in bed, I'm trying to figure out, you know, Google how to create television content. And I'm, I'm still trying to, mm. so, and then I just realized it, I was not getting better. And I said, this is, I, I, I'm not getting paid enough for this. It's not mm-hmm. even so much about the pay. It was more feeling valued and valuable, valuable enough to be included in key yeah. decisions and meetings that would affect my day-to-day workload, you know, and I don't know, it, it is, it is hard to function when you don't feel you know, when you're kind of excluded from the team, which is another form of yeah. workplace bullying, yeah. keeping critical information away from the person so they can't do their job, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I've had the gamut. I've, it's, it, I've had the gamut of it. I'll tell you. I'm so glad you're out of that now. And you're, you're, you're using your platform to speak <laughs> up about it. And that's, what's important. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you just published your first one for the Philadelphia Business journal. Business, yeah, yeah, that was excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That, so I just moved back to Philly, right? Um, and originally, so when I moved back to America, I was going to go off to Chicago, but I was just like, you know what? I want to give back to my community uh, because they helped me so much. So mm-hmm. I'm just going to stay here, be in Philly. And one way that I wanted to do that was to give back to the Philadelphia Business Journal and just create content for them, right? Mm-hmm. And it's something to other people, it might be so small, but to me, it's just like, wow, I'm, I'm giving back, you know? <laughs> no, I know. It's a good feeling. Yeah, you're going to be a, an amazing um, influencer for them. You know, someone, I'm sure they're very happy to have you on the team yeah. contributing. That's fantastic. So one of my things, Heidi, when I have guests is I ask them a question. Sure. Um, but, you know, we've talked about a lot of stuff today, we did. good and bad, right? <laughs> but um, what quality of a gentlewoman do you think is the most important to emulate and why? I would say empathy to me is hands down. It's, uh, for me, empathy is just 
being human, right? Like you are understanding that it's not all about you, that everyone is going through their own thing. And similar to me when um, I said I sort of hated everybody else because they didn't go through the bad things that I went through. Mm -hmm. And but it's also not seeing and I, at that point, I wasn't seeing the bad things that they could potentially be going through. And as you know, a gentle woman, a leader, a boss, a manager, whoever, even a coworker, you know, if someone's having an off day, maybe they're disengaged. Instead of coming down on them with a hammer, talk to them, mm -hmm. figure it out. Like what are, what's going on? COVID-19 is a prime example, mm -hmm. right? There's so many managers and employers that are thinking profit first and employee uh, wellness after. And I called that out in a recent Forbes article because I thought that's disgusting to me. Mm -hmm. That lacks empathy. And yes, you may get your short-term wins. You know, you may get those profits you're looking for, but long-term you just lost the respect, the loyalty, all of that from not only in your your uh, team or your employee, but your team and their family and anyone they communicate with. And oh, guess what? The community that is watching you. That's so right. When I think about empathy, it's, yeah, okay, you want to get profits, but if you have to hurt other people to do it, I, that's not okay. So, that's Yeah, it. absolutely. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's, it is, it's a beautiful quality because I think, well, there's actually a term, um, I think it ha it's like almost the opposite of a narcissist is an empath. They, I've yeah. you heard the term, an yeah. empath, which I had never, I've heard of empathy, of course, over and over again, but someone that lives that way is an empath and there, there's a emotional intelligence there on a very intense peak level. Yeah. And I think, I think it's a beautiful quality you picked and it's so critical, you know, professionally and in our personal lives yeah. to have it. Um, yeah. You know, like I was saying earlier, I've had a few people, you know, reach out that are now unemployed, lost their jobs. Oh my God. Oh. And I, I kind of want to say, where were you seven months ago when, when I was struggling yeah. trying to figure out unemployment and, and all, and, and not, that's kind of an immature reaction, but I'm just being honest. I felt like that because it's like, because it didn't affect you. You didn't care yep. now, now yeah. that it's affecting you. So if we, can remember that like yeah. this may not be affecting me directly right now but it could someday or how what would I need right now if I was in this person's shoes yeah. and, um, and um, so when I lived in Germany we have this saying and it's basically the translation of it is you always meet someone twice in life and that always sticks with me because whoever you do wrong you're gonna have to face them again through some sort of weird circumstance and this is I always, like that <laughs> it always has come back to me you know anybody that I've done wrong in my past I've somehow had to face them whether directly or indirectly and that that saying just sticks with me it's like just be human and kind and compassionate <laughs> like do it right the first time oh. right right yeah. right um that's I love that little uh, German <laughs> saying, yeah, I love yeah. that. <laughs> kind of like karma, but in German. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, but it's been such a pleasure meeting you and getting to know you better and hearing about your work and all the amazing things you're doing for the um, for employees and employers. And I know your work is international too, so that's starting a whole new movement and. I think you're going to go great places and do amazing things. Not that you haven't already, but it's just going to keep going. I hope I'm so. sure. Of it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Heidi, if people want to get in touch with you, you have a website. Um, you want to let people know how they can keep tabs on what you're up to and get in touch. Yeah, absolutely. So my website is Heidi Lynn, L-Y-N-N-E, C-O.com. And from there, you can visit all my social media. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, I would say, uh, pretty active on LinkedIn and my website. But when you go to my website, mm -hmm. um, you'll see a little tab that says newsletter. 
from there, I highly recommend subscribing to my newsletter. I send out so many great things like leadership tips, um, Mm -hmm. stories, success stories, the clients, things that I'm going through. You get to go with me along my journey, um, workplace culture things. And I always do article and blog roundups too. Um, Not specifically my blog section on my website, but different places that I publish and post and things that would be beneficial. So definitely sign up. I don't, I send out one weekly email. So, okay. Yeah. yeah that's not going to drown your inbox. <laughs> no. I think that subscriptions to Heidi Lynn.com are going to outweigh subscriptions to the New York times someday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That'd be great. <laughs> Get on her list now, people. Be a VIP subscriber. <laughs> All right, great. So I'll put all of that information in the podcast notes once I drop the podcast. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully do a follow up. Yeah. And see how things are going. I'd love to have you on again and um, keep working at your book. I know it's a challenge. I'm going through it myself. But yeah, you know, keep working at it. You really battle a lot of imposter syndrome when you release what you've been battling, you know, or even overcome, right? (laughs) It's true. It's true. But you know what? I go back to Heather Monaghan too. Like her book is extremely personal. She talks about things that, I mean, a lot of us, just again, because of societal pressure, we wouldn't want people maybe to know about us or our family or our background. She puts it, I mean, she's, which like she says, like when you, when you just When you lay waste to the shame, there's nothing, there's no more shame because now it's out there. And I mean, we all have to find that comfort zone of how much to share, but it was very empowering for her to do it. And the amount of people she's helped because she did it, you know, that's, that's her reward as well. So yeah, I can't wait to read it someday. (laughs) Yeah. I'll keep you updated on my journey. (laughs) Okay. All right. So please stay safe. Social distance, stay yes. in your apartment, get food <laughs> delivered. Yes, thank you and, so um, much, Michelle. I'll be in touch soon. Okay, take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.